Gerard, thank you for taking the time to come here this morning. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I'm Jake Garay from the Garay Mashaw team with Berkshire Hathaway. And you're listening to my podcast, Selling the Suburbs. I'm sitting down with real estate agents, investors, experts, and various professionals throughout the industry. On Selling the Suburbs, we're discussing the truth about real estate, entrepreneurship, and the ever-changing housing market. I think first and foremost, let's have you kind of share with us your story, kind of what you've done as far back as you want to that led you to today. You know, I know you've got a You've lived many different lives, so yeah. I'd love to hear kind of, you know, some some background about it. Sure. Uh, I went to college and uh, at Mount St. Mary um, in, in good old Newburgh, New York, uh, not, not far from uh, where our office is. Um, after college, I started working with people with developmental disabilities. I was teaching music to them. Uh, did that for a while. Um, kind of had enough of it after a while um, and then ended up working for David Letterman. Um, I was a stagehand for a while, which was pretty awesome. I got to meet some cool people and uh, do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, eventually he retired, which wasn't the best. Um, I, I'm a musician myself, so I uh, ended up going out on tour and just kind of going and doing my own thing for a couple of years. I'm kind of taking what I had learned from Letterman and... Um, trying to apply it to, you know what type of music it was like mellow uh like acoustic rock um some songs could get a little bit a little bit more intense but for the most part it was pretty mellow it was it was pretty uh like hippie-ish kind of 1960s acoustic rock um did that for a while um it was fun but being on the road by yourself, I, I toured by myself for years. So being by myself, just doing it, literally taking, you know, three, four flights a week, um, living in hotel rooms, living, literally living out of a suitcase um, for months at a time, just kind of uh, eventually just wasn't for me. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard lifestyle. Um, so after I, I eventually just said it was it was too much. It was I was not making the millions of dollars that I was expecting, um, <laughs> and uh, eventually I was just like, this is this is not worth it. Um, when, people don't understand when, when musicians start to get bigger, their expenses get bigger. You know, so it's not like you just like it's not like a straight trajectory. Like it's like you start making more money, but then all of a sudden, like you start playing bigger venues and they want like insurance policies and stuff like that. So every show that I played, I had to take out an insurance policy, um, which starts getting really expensive. Um, so it, I was making like decent money per show, but then all of the things afterwards started cutting into it so much. I mean, I literally hotel rooms, cars, you know, like everything that, encompasses living on the road it's a it's a tough it's tough to make any money even if you are making some money like it's tough because you're constantly spending it um so eventually i was just like i gotta get out of here and, and figure something else out um i did something kind of weird after not weird but i got lofty with things where i i found these guys on linkedin that were um molecular biologists that had come up with a system to do what was called PCR testing in a doctor's office. So they didn't have to, uh, like a doctor didn't have to like send out their specimens to a lab. They could do it right. They could do any of their specimen testing in their office. Now this is pre COVID. Yes. Yes. Cause obviously PCR test is something everybody's familiar with now. Now, but, now everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But no, then, no, nobody knew what nobody PCR, knew no, what polymers chain reactions weren't big, uh, <laughs> Big news back then. It's going to be a quiz at the end of this. There is. There is. And I hope everyone's ready. <laughs> um, so I did that for a while where I was kind of going out to doctor's offices and um, pitching this system. And um, it started going really well. Um, but then unfortunately, you know, like, like you just said, COVID happened um, where although that was a huge boost for the PCR testing originally when COVID started, there wasn't the PCR test for COVID. Um, so we weren't allowed into any doctor's offices at that point. I couldn't, so couldn't, ta couldn't talk to any doctors. And the installation teams that were literally coming and bringing the labs in wouldn't travel. Like ours was based in Georgia. Um, so we had, I mean, I lost literally about $100,000 in 36 hours. 
um, because the we had a bunch of contracts that were fully executed, and then we couldn't perform on our end because we couldn't put the the labs into the offices. Um, How the hell did you go from music to working with molecular biologists? <laughs> Like, what was the, was there a transition yeah. period where you're like, what well, do I want to do? Like, how do you even make when that, I was, that leap? When I was originally in college, I was pre-med. Um, so I was pre-med for two years and I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to kind of go through this whole process. Originally, I actually wanted to be a pediatrician. Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith. Exactly. That's the most exactly. generic name of all time. I was probably going to change my name. <laughs> um, but, but, um, so I, I, I always had a bit of an interest in, you know, biology and that kind of stuff. Um, I, would, I then was in college and started going through that entire, like going deeper into it and realized that, to, well, I realized two things. One, I don't like cutting anything. Like, like, like you had to, like they started like going into stuff about like, uh, you know, like cadavers and stuff like that. I remember being like, that was, I might have to find something else. And then I also remembered thinking like, all right, well, I don't work with kids. You know, I'll be, I was like, I'll be a pediatrician. I won't even have to worry about that. Um, and then I remember thinking like, well, potentially I could get like a, a really sick kid and like, God forbid, like lose them, you know, like, and then I remember thinking that like, I can't handle that. You know, like, like, I don't, I don't, I still don't. I mean, I have clients that are doctors that, have to deal with that kind of stuff on a regular basis. And I just don't know how they do. Like emotionally, I don't think I could. I think you have to just kind of try and desensitize yourself to it. Totally, totally. But it's, um, I could never do but that it was, I mean, I mean, that was, uh, I don't know. It, I mean, it, it kind of pulled me away from it all. Oh, and also I got girl obsessed and went crazy in college. And that, 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 makes, that makes medical school a difficult thing to get into. <laughs> Um, but so, uh, after the lab, uh, business kind of fizzled out because of COVID, um, I was literally home, um, with my son trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Um, and literally me and my wife were looking at buying houses. Um, we were kind of going out with a realtor. Um, she was fine, but she wasn't anything special. Um, and you know, I just eventually kind of like looked at my wife and I was like, I think I can do this. You know, I was like, you know, like it, she seems like she's doing really well and she's not really doing a great job with us. So I was like, I think I could do this and I can do this much better than her. So I was like, if she can do it and be successful, I was like, I don't know why I couldn't do it. Right. Um, so now I'm here today having this podcast with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting progression of things. Yeah. So how, what was, I mean, the draw right? With real estate. Like, well, I, I'm always, I always go into rabbit holes. Cause obviously you're, you, I should say this, right. You're very entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Um, I think being a traveling musician, as you said before, you alluded to it a little bit. I think we, as the consumer don't realize that it's a business, right. And you have to run it like a business. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of parallels there between music and even being a real estate agent, because eight, you know, being an agent, people think they just see the surface level stuff, right? Like what you said, I'm out with an agent, I'm going and looking at houses, you show the house, you tell them about it, you talk to people, that's all you do. Mm -hmm. But you don't see kind of the back end, the systems that you have to have in place to, to do it well and to be really successful, yeah. right? Because to be able to do 50, 60, 70, 100 deals a year, you've got to have some way of managing all of those people and a lot of the people that you work with don't often transact, right? So mm -hmm. like, if you wanna sell 50 houses, you gotta have a database of five, 10,000 people that you've gotta be able to manage and there's gotta be systems in place. And so with music, as you said, you've got insurance, you've got logistical planning, you've got promotion, you're in marketing, you're in sales, like everything that you're doing is marketing and sales. I always get a kick out of people when they're like, oh, I don't wanna be in sales. And it's like, no matter what you do, you're selling yourself. Right. If you're out on a date, you've got to sell yourself to whoever you're out on a date with. If you mm -hmm. want to get a job, if you're in an interview, what are you doing? You're selling yourself to that interviewer on why they should hire you. So sales is extremely important. So when you're a musician, you've got marketing, you've got sales, you've got logistics, you've got you know accounting, you've got all those different things. 
and nobody sees that except for the person that actually right. has access to all that information. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest reasons that you know artists in general fail is because they don't look at it like a, a business. They don't they don't put those systems in place. And and honestly, for me, it was a learning experience because I had to figure out how to do that kind of on the fly. Working at Letterman, I figured out how to work on the shows. You mm -hmm. know, like I mean, literally, like how do you place the cables and, and and like how do you run wires and stuff like that. Um, it took time to figure out that. If, if I want to be almost like the arrogant musician of, or just of being like, well, I'm just very good at this. I'm not, I'm not even saying that I was very good, but if anybody wants to say like, oh, I'm just- Look up I'm, Gerard Smith I'm on this. Spotify. Yeah, do it. <laughs> um, even if, uh, I, I think that there's a, a big learning curve with trying to say that you're an artist and then being saying, I want to make a real career out of this because a lot of people will just say, my art is so good and I'm just going to throw it out there and it's going to just be accepted by the masses when they don't really understand that there's like a lot of foot traffic behind that, that you have to do to get it to the masses. To that point. There's so much opportunity in the world right now. I mean, just with the internet, you know, there, there's, you know, in the 1950s, you'd, you'd listen to like the radio say, and you'd hear, you know, 20 different artists, you know, like now you can go online, you can go on Spotify. 20 and, in an hour. Yeah. Like, I mean, how many times, but then the cream really has to rise to the top. And not only does the cream have to rise to the top, but that cream has to have real push behind it. There has to be real motivation because if people are just like, well, I'm just going to throw this out there and it's just going to work. They don't want to be salesmen. That's what it right. is. They, they almost just want to say, well, I'm just so good that I don't need to do that. And it's not real. Yeah, I think you've got artists who are like once in a generation talents who rise to the top, right? That are yeah. just discovered at a very young age and are just phenomenal. And their talent is just incredible, right? But that's not, that's one out of every 100. That's not every single... Right you know, artists in order to make it, it's a big commitment, a, a big, um, well, you have to make it your business. You know right, I mean? You have to, right. you have to have a business plan. You have to have, you know, an executable plan in front of you that says, you know, this is how I'm going to be successful. If I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to make this amount of progress. And then tracking that, um, a lot of people don't do it. And yeah. that's, I mean, you know, music itself is very hard anyway, but, um, I think a huge reason that a lot of people start, spend a lot of money. I mean, recording is thousands and thousands of dollars. The average song that you hear on the radio costs between ten and $15,000 just to record. That's crazy. That's not, that's, that, that, that doesn't take into account any of the instruments, any of the session players that you have to do, you know, like hire, mm -hmm. or any of the, um, the marketing that you have to do after it. Because they always say that anything that you put into recording, you should double for the marketing. So say you do, you know, fifteen thousand dollars on a recording just for one song. Right. So now you're at forty five grand. Right. You're at forty five grand for one song. Yeah. And that's your shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you so don't if have you, a real plan behind and that, if the song yeah. sucks. You're and screwed. a lot of people put out really bad songs and yeah. spend a lot of money on that. I think you made a good comparison. Like in the 1950s, right? There was in music, there was like gatekeepers. Like if you knew totally. someone and they made the right connection, you're on the radio, you became yeah. a celebrity, you were successful. And then with the internet, it's like everybody can just go out and put out a video on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. And it's kind of the same exact thing for business as well. Like I remember 10 years ago, 2010, 2012, 2013, you know, like when Facebook was really just starting to become popular um you could go out and like as a business you could post on facebook and like nobody was there no big brands were there pepsi wasn't right. there coca-cola you know chevy like nobody was there advertising spending real money trying to get the attention they were all advertising on you know youtube or uh, not youtube um you know on, on tv commercials and, and radio ads and so over time once the attention kind of shifted more and more towards social media now the small one person, two person company, that single individual, like you can't compete organically with those companies for attention and, and for, you know, people's eyeballs essentially. Mm -hmm. So now you have to advertise and you have to pay and you have to create content. You have to do all different types of marketing and it's constantly changing now. 
because everybody with a phone in their hand, a smartphone can basically take a 10 second video and post it and have the potential to reach millions of people. So it's a completely different environment than it was when, you know, you had to have a big, huge marketing budget to be able to compete. Like if you're putting out content and it's really good and you have a way of distributing it, then now you can reach so many more people. So it's, yeah. it's a completely different time and way of doing business. And I think there's a lot of parallels there with, with music. So obviously you have that background, you have that experience, you worked on Letterman. So like you have that experience of working with a team. I think all of those different experiences, it's funny how like you can never really know when you're doing it, where it leads. But then looking back, it kind of makes more sense. Like, hey, I worked on this team. I, I learned how to pay attention to little details. Like, where do you put a cord? And how do you kind of put these pieces of the puzzle together? And then you did your own thing, which probably gave you a whole bunch of different experience. And then now you're here selling real estate. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting progression. And I think it makes a lot of sense when you look at the parallels. Like you were saying, there is a lot of parallels. And I think that one of the the strongest ones that I see is the need for consistency. Whereas, I mean, there's, they they would always say, you know, to people at Letterman when I would poke their brains about, you know, like how, how do I blow up and how do I do this? And they'd say, well, in reality, you have to have a song come out, you know, every couple of weeks, you know, because if you're not on top of mind, people just forget there's so much there, you know, like there, there's so much music, there's so much art, there's anything that if you're not consistently producing and producing stuff that's good, like it, it can't just be, I'm just throwing something out there. It has to be something good. And if you're not doing that on a consistent basis and you're not willing to put in the work, the money behind it. Question, as an artist, do you know, like when you write a song and, and record that song, like do you know that that song is good? Or do you think no. it is? And then the way it's like, do you know how it's going to be received? No. Well, so there's in music, there's formulas. Uh, like one, it's called like a one, four, five formula or one, three, four formula where it's um, pop formulas. So, so you can plug it, you can say, all right, I, I sing well in the key of G. So I'm going to start on G because that's the first note. And then there's literally a pattern that you can follow that a million other songs will follow. And it's just going to be kind of pleasing to the ear. So a lot of times like you can hear a song for the first time and you can say, I, I like, I know where this is going. You know, like, like you can, you can like just be kind of listening to it and say like 20 seconds in, you can almost guess the next note that's mm -hmm. coming. It's because you've already heard that before. Like, like it's a combination. Right. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a formula that other people have used. So there's like, there are those kind of formulas where you're like, all right, this is a, this is a pop song. This is how we're going to make a pop song. Like uh, Genesis has a song called Abaca because uh, songs are generally written in ABC formula. So it's um, A is a verse, B is a chorus, C is a bridge. And then Abaca was literally the formula for that song. It doesn't have anything to do with what they're saying, what about. they're saying, but it didn't yeah. matter because they were like, we're just going to make Abaca <laughs> <laughs> and then it's going to be well received because that's a very popular kind of formula. Um, the risk that you run with that is that stuff gets really boring. Repetitive. Yeah. If, if, if you don't you just blend in, you right. Don't stand out. Exactly. If, if you don't like do something special with it, but that's also where brilliance can happen, where you could take something very simple and then make it brilliant. You know, like we've talked about that, like where you go out and like, um, you know, you can go to like a, a steakhouse and they can cook you a steak. Like I can, I can, you can come over to my house, I can cook you a steak, you know, it'll be edible. Like you know, like <laughs> you'll eat it, you know, it'll be fine. Um, but then like you can go to like a, a like a, you know, like a Morton's or something like that and you eat their steak and you're like, this is a very simple thing, but they've done something way different with this. This is incredible. Um, there's like genius in that. Um, but that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to figure out how to do that. It's not just like a fly by night thing. And a lot of people just think, well, I, I can just play these three chords, these four chords and I'll make a hit song. And it's like, that's no, not, it's going to suck. Not, yeah. It's not going to be any good. It's interesting. I mean, it's just hearing you speak about that and talking about even just cooking, like there's formulas to doing something really well, mm -hmm. but the quality of, of the ingredients going in, 
matters as well, right? Like, so if you're recording a song, you could record the best song ever, but if like you're recording it on your iPhone, it's not going to sound good. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have to have quality input to get quality output. If you yeah. go in and order a steak and it's the worst quality steak you've ever had, yeah, you might be able to make it better, but you're never going to make it, you know, the best, you know, filet that you've ever had. Right. Like, well, cause there's a lot behind that, you know, like, like if you were to have the best filet that you've ever had, more than likely the, the person that made that filet has dedicated a lot of time to doing that, you know, like years yeah. and years of practice. I mean, even and can, attention to detail. Yeah. I mean, you, can, you can, you can even relate that to real estate where you can say, I mean, you know, A to Z, all right, we're going to look at a house and then Z is we close on the house and it's like, all right, well, that's the formula. And it's like, yeah, but there's a lot, right. There's a process. There's a whole lot in between and it can look very simple. Like it can look like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to sign and then enjoy happily ever after. It'll be right. wonderful. <laughs> um, but there is a lot of different steps. And if people aren't prepared for those steps beforehand, you're going to stumble all over them. And I, th I, th I think about that a lot because you're absolutely right. And I, I speak about that a lot with just experience in general, right? Like, obviously we've talked a lot about what we try and do as a team in providing a different quality experience um, and focusing not just on the service because the service that you provide is going to be the same, right? It's like, if you go, let's put it this way. If you go to the best steakhouse in New York city and you go to, you know, McDonald's, there's someone there cooking the food. They're providing the same service. The quality of what you receive is different. Right. And that's the same thing with what we do. It's like you may go work with two different people and they provide the same service, right? They're going to show you houses. They're going to tell you, you know, what's going on. They're going to try and help you close. But like the quality of the experience is going to be completely different, right? Because there's experience that each of those individuals have. There's knowledge that they have. There's attention to detail, every little detail, you know, in a, in a purchase offer can make the difference. Uh, in an inspection, every, every little thing matters. And it's a completely different experience when you work with someone who, like you said, has spent years and years on that craft and is in it 10, 12, 15 hours a day versus, you know, the person who's brand new or the person who is doing it, but doesn't pay attention to detail, doesn't care, isn't trying to create the best experience possible. So, um, there's a lot of parallels there for all of these different things. I guess what you, you've basically been saying is that success in anything basically has the same fundamentals. Yeah. I mean, it has to, I mean, why would anybody just be successful? If you just tried something and just became amazingly successful, you, it's like you're hitting the lottery. It's not a real thing. It's right. like, it's a, it's an extreme exception. It's not the rule. Um, Anyone that does that almost, it's like detrimental to everybody else because everyone else looks and says, oh, okay, you know, I, I can do that. In reality, if you want to be successful, you really have to start at the absolute bottom. I mean, in my opinion, at least that's, that's where I always found any success that I've ever found was starting from the bottom, trying to figure out who can I learn from um, and how can I work as hard in that direction that they're showing me I should be working in. Um, if you're not willing to do that, you can still provide an experience. It's just going to be a crappy experience. <laughs> it's going to be, it's not going to be a good one. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there's, but there's, there's a lot of that out there. There's a lot of bad musicians. There's a lot of bad realtors. You know, like you said something interesting because you talked about if you have a lot of success very early on without doing something, it's not sustainable if you're not that person. Right. And I believe it's the law of compensation that states that you earn exactly what essentially you provide in value to your community, mm -hmm. right? So your income level, your happiness level, all of that is going to be in direct comparison to whatever value you're providing to everybody else around you. And so that's like a big thing with, for example, lottery winners, right? We all hear the story of the guy who wins $10 million and then 18 months later, they're bankrupt. And it's because they're not the person that's worth that. Exactly. They're not the person who is capable of receiving and then keeping it. And so 
you are make an absolutely true point. Like if you don't become that person, it's not sustainable. It's not you and you can't re-earn it. You can't redo it until you go out and become that person that's able to provide that level of value to the people in your community. But it's you're absolutely right. Um, but even aside from the sustainability of it, I think that the quality of your life oftentimes comes down to what you've put into beforehand. If you haven't struggled, like if, if you like the lottery winners, the, the reason that they blow a lot of that is because they not only are they just not that person, but they didn't earn it. You know, it doesn't mean anything. There wasn't any blood behind it. So like it's, it's, it's frivolous that you, right. you, you, you'll spend stupid money on something. I don't spend money on anything. My wife gets all mad at me all the time because I get my money and I'm like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm like saving this or I'm going to invest it You're into something it. like that. Well, like I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm like, I'm gonna earn this. Yeah. Like, this is my damn money. Yeah. Um, because I've earned it though. You know what I mean? Like, because like I go out there and I well, you have an like, appreciation for it. Right. Exactly. It's not, it's not frivolous you know it, it's it's there's more to it um and i think that that's how you kind of set that that base and then grow off of it is you really have to struggle to get there you know i think i think that it's it's almost important sometimes well it's perspective and and perception right i mean it's amazing because you have these conversations and everything in life is dichotomy right like there's you can't have good without bad like you don't know if something is good if you haven't experienced bad if everything was just good, then there's, it's just, it is like, there is no good or bad. It's just one or the other. And it's also the way you perceive something, right? So in every single negative outcome, there's an opportunity there, right? So if you have the mindset, let's say you want to lose weight and you're like, oh, I, you know, I gained a lot of weight and this is a, you know, I'm really unhappy about it. This is a bad thing. It's like, well, that's a negative mindset to have around that that one element of your life. Whereas you could change it and reframe it and say, this is a great opportunity for me to learn how to become healthier, to eat better, to exercise better. And it's the same thing with money. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm unhappy. I don't have enough money or I don't have a house or, and it's, it's a negative experience to be in that moment, but it's, you can reframe that and say, this is an opportunity for me to learn how to go out and get what I want. This is an opportunity for me to get a new job, become happier and, and grow as a result of it. And I think people spend so much time in the negative and focusing on the bad instead of trying to find the good that could come from it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously there's a mental health crisis in the United States. And I think that honestly, one of the, the biggest things is, is kind of like you're saying that people will will beat themselves up a lot of times you know like I, I know a lot of times i mean me myself you know i've gone to the gym and been like you fat bastard like i'm gonna go and like i'm gonna go run four miles and i'm gonna go like torture myself because like i had mcdonald's yesterday and i'm a bad boy but like i mean it, but the real success comes in not doing that though it comes in and saying well i'm gonna do this because i love myself because i like because this is what's best for me and that and it's with anything it's with real estate it's with investing where if you're not if you're just doing it or you're treating yourself poorly while you're trying to accomplish something you start to become one of your own adversaries. You know, you, you start to become one of the reasons that you're probably going to fail because you're always locked in in your own head. You know, you've always well, you got put, some. You put limiting beliefs on yourself, exactly. right? Because now you start to believe what you're telling yourself. And now it's like, well, I am X, Y, and Z, so I might as well just continue to be that person. Right. Right? It's like, self-affirming. Exactly. Instead of saying, I'm not this person, I want to become this, that's who I am. I heard something once that was, you're not, who you are today is not who you are. It's just the accumulation of everything that you've been and done your entire life. But who you are today, you have the choice to make a conscious decision to become who you want to be, right? It's just the accumulation of everything that's happened to you, but it doesn't mean that that's who you are. It's just the results of what's happened. And you can every single day, all of us have the opportunity to go out and change what those results are, to become whoever it is that we want to be and do whatever it is that we want to do. So you just have to reframe your mindset and say, today is an opportunity to go and do 
whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah, I mean, not to get too lofty, but um, like on the the that kind of biological. No, you should get lofty. I will get lofty. I'm about to. Um, from that biological standpoint, um, every ten years or so, every single cell in your body has died. Did you know that? That your body is constantly just replicating yourself. So you can look at literally the person you were 10 years ago and you are a completely different person. Right. That you're they've replicated onto themselves so that you know it's it's a you know a continuing pattern. But in reality, who you are today should be very different than who you were 10 years ago. You ever look at like uh, Facebook memories? You know, like 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 they I try they, and avoid them. Everyone does, <laughs> not, but that's that's what it is. Everyone everyone does some cringy things on it's there. Horrifically cringy, like this stuff that I put up. Put up like, I got like tweets out there that are like making pizza oh, rolls. Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> when I was it's like brutal sixteen. Yeah, totally. And and that's most people. You know, like I I look at it, I constantly delete them because I'm like, oh, God, you dork. I do but, love pizza rolls though. I, I pizza rolls I, are awesome. I, I enjoy myself a good pizza roll, of course, <laughs> but. uh I think that you're supposed to look back on that stuff and say, well, I'm a different person now. Right. You know, like, yeah, I did write that 10 years ago. That's how I felt at that time, but it's not how I feel today um, because I am different now. You know, I've, I've grown. If, if you're successfully living, I think you're continuing to evolve. If you're looking back at stuff that you did 10 years ago and you're like, yep, that's the cat's pajamas right there. That's I always thought that way too. Like I remember when I was in, high school and like all my friends were going away to college everybody was like you better enjoy this this is the these are the best years of your life losers right but like i never understood that because it's like such a defeatist mentality yeah. you're like 18 19 20 24 25 and you're like well this is as good as it's gonna get it's all downhill yeah. from here and it's like if if you're not going out every single day trying to improve your life, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing it? You know, I'm always very interested in why people do things because I just find it fascinating, right? Like, why did you do what you did? Why are you in real estate? Why are you going on vacation? Why, like, just to find out why people do the things that they do and why they're passionate, I just find it very, very interesting. And to think that someone would be like, having that mentality at that young of an age it's just at that point what are you living for why are you living if you know and and what's the next step like how do you get out of that cycle because once you get into it it's tough there's a lot of people that do believe that i'm sure you went to high school with people i definitely did that were like um you know the, the quote unquote you know like popular kids that like literally peaked at like 17 like that was the height of their life. Like they were like mini celebrities in this kind of general area. And then you realize like you get out of high school and it's like, oh, like they mean literally nothing. Like they're all like not doing anything with their life. Like they all like get hammered on like Tuesdays at like, you know, like 3.30 PM. They're like, all right, it's time to go. And it's like, all right, man, maybe you weren't so cool at all. <laughs> like you just are doing the same thing you were doing 10 years ago. Well, because that's where like they, were thought of as successful, you know? So like they didn't want to expand. There's a lot of people that they, they don't want to continue to grow. And that's also, I mean, you can almost look at it from the angle of like, that's, that's, that's why they don't do it. You know, they, like, well, they, you they get, get comfortable. Stuck. Yeah. They get stuck. I, I was, I forget who, who I was listening to, but they, I think it was Tony Robbins talks about that. If you take like a scale of one to 10, right. And it's a comfortability scale. The most dangerous place to be is like a four or five or a six where it's like not that bad. It's not that good. You're kind of just there. Oh, yeah. Right. Where it's like things aren't really bad. They're really not terrible. They're not great. They're not exactly what I want, but I don't need to change. Like I'm comfortable here. You know, if you're at a one, you're like this is you've hit rock bottom. It sucks. You hate it. And you're like, I need to figure out a way to change my life and get to a better place. Like what I've, what I'm doing is not working. There needs to be a way to, to grow and, and get out of this. Or if you're at a nine or an eight and things are really, really good, you're like, how do I get to a 10? Right? Because that's just human nature. Human nature is to want to expand, want to grow. Right? So if you're there and your things are going really well, 
you have this self-esteem, you have great confidence. You're like, if I can do these things, why can't I take it to the next level? So I think a lot of people get stuck in like that four, five, six, where it's like, yeah, I'm comfortable. It's okay. It's not that bad, but I'm just going to stay here because this is what I'm familiar with. This is what I know instead of being like, how do I improve my life? How do I get out of this? And how do I make it even better? And I think some people will push back and say, well, why do you need to, right? Why do you need to grow? If you're happy, if you're good, who cares? And I just feel that a lot of people want to do other things, right? Like, let's just say you want to help your parents pay their bills, or you want to provide a better quality of life for your kids, right? You want to pay for their college. You want to provide them with the best opportunities. You want to be able to, you know, give them every opportunity they could possibly want. Maybe your child is extremely gifted and plays an instrument and you need to spe- you know, send them to some special school that's going to cost you $75,000 a year. And you're literally going to prevent your child from pursuing their dreams because you can't support them. You can't do that for them. Or we've talked about this a lot. God forbid you walk outside today, you get hit by a bus and now you're disabled and you can't work. What, what are you doing to prepare for that? I think everybody has this idea that like, I'm good if things go the same exact way that they're going for the next 20 years, 30 years. And it's like, we all know that's not how life works, especially after the last three years that we've all been through. You know, if you go to January 1st of 2019 and say, let me tell you what you're about to experience, (laughs) right? Yeah. Nobody would have believed that. I mean, when it was happening, everybody was like, eh, you know, this isn't going to happen. This isn't real. This isn't what's going on. And I just think that it's human nature for us to have recency bias. Things have been this way, so they're going to continue this way. And it's like, it's funny because Jordan Belfort is the one that I heard say it, but he says, if no amount of poverty can make someone wealthy. No amount of sadness can make someone happy. So if you're a sad person, you're not going to be able to make someone else happy. If you're a poor person, you're not going to be able to provide wealth for the people around you. And when I say wealth, I don't just mean money. I'm talking about health, wealth, love, and happiness. Those are like the big four pillars of life, right? I think everybody wants more wealth, everybody wants better health, everybody wants more love, and everybody wants more happiness. I think all of those things are very tightly interconnected. And if you don't have one of those areas in an abundance, you can't help someone else have that. And so I just feel that if you want to improve the lives of the people around you, you need to go out every single day and do that, right? Improve upon those four areas so that you can help other people. And I think that's the most, I think personally, that's the area that I think most happiness is found, right? Like when you go out and you, you know, treat your wife to a great date or you make her a nice dinner or you take them, your, your family on a really nice vacation and you get to experience that time together and that happiness together, like that probably is when you're the happiest. Am I wrong? No, yeah, I think that you're right. And so like going out there and providing happiness to other people is the, best way that you're going to find happiness yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's also why being in that kind of four to five range that you were talking about is so dangerous is because that's like the complacency zone Mm -hmm. where you're like, well, I can pay all my bills. Like I can, you know, I can do, you know, I can go on my vacation a year. I can pay for everything, but life is going to throw variables at you. And if you think that you just have this set plan, like until you die, where you're just like, all right, this is like, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to do this and I'm going to do it every day. And I'm just going to eventually, I'm not going to wake up. Um, at some point you're going to hit a really bad roadblock. And unfortunately, a lot of people hit it sometimes when they get older. I mean, you can make, you know, you can coast on say, I don't want to say coast, but like, say you're making $70,000 a year and you're like, okay, like, I'm like, I'm all right. Like I can, you know, pay my, you know, my general bills and, and I can do that. Um, but like you said, at some point, something's going to happen where that $70,000 isn't a ton of money that, you know, like somebody's going to get sick or something, you know, something awful is going to happen. You could have a kid. Right. I mean, yeah, you you could have 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 another kid. Have have an accident, you know, things, things change. And I also think you have to have control, right? I think having control over your life is so important because you don't want to be too dependable on other people. I know that's something that I've talked a lot with you about. It's like you need to have the ability to provide for yourself and not rely on somebody else, you know? 
So I just think that there's a lot more out there for people. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, I don't know, I forget who said it. So I don't know, I don't know if it's my Says favorite Gerard quote. Smith is yeah, about to this is probably quote one of, himself. It's probably one of my quotes. I'll put it in quotations. But it's, when something hurts bad enough, you'll do something about it. You know, and if, if you're not in any, people need to almost maintain a hunger even when there's not pain. That, that's something that can get really difficult because you can be at that one level where you're like, I'm literally hungry. I mean, like, literally, there, <laughs> there was a time when I was a musician, I was making no money and I had my apartment in the Bronx and I literally was like, I'm really hungry for like, uh, like I was like, I want dessert. And I just dis distinctly remember it. I drank syrup. I was like, I'm just like, I don't have any money. So I was like, I want something sweet. And I had a little syrup and I was like, I want to drink a little syrup. And I remember like sitting on my couch afterwards and being like, you are a loser. I was like, look at what you've done. Um, but then I remember being like, I don't want to ever feel like this again. You know, like, so like, I was like, I have to do something. I have to like continue on. So that like, sp like literally that single moment spurred on like a lot for me. Whereas if people don't like, let's say I was, you know, at that time making say, you know, 70, 80 grand a year and was like, I'm going to go get Carvel or something like that. And something, something luxurious, <laughs> then, you know, maybe I just sit there, you know, like maybe I just kind of, I'm like, all right, well, that's fine. It's not a, a life changing moment for you. Right. You know, like, like sometimes you, you need to struggle, but then even so like you can go from that one where you're struggling and it's a literal like everyday struggle, but then you can get to like that five range. But if you don't have that continuing hunger behind you to kind of push you into seven, eight, nine, ten, then you're probably going to slide back to, you know, like two, three, four, one. Well, you're one, you're unfortunately, you're one disaster away exactly. from being in a really tough spot again. Exactly. And right? a lot of people don't recognize that. Well, they don't have contingency plans, right? Like you hear a lot of the military guys, special forces and things like that, like they'll set a plan. And then they'll go through and be like, let's run a bunch of scenarios as to what we're going to do if this happens. Is it going to ever happen? Maybe, maybe not. But at least then you're planning for it, right? So it's like if you go throughout your life and you just say, well, if this happens, this happens, and this happens, I'll be good. And if you don't have a contingency plan on like, what if I get into a car accident? What if I have a, 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 a child that I don't expect to have? What if... I lose my job. What if these things happen? What's the fallback plan? And a lot of people don't have that contingency plan. They just, they don't want to think about the negative stuff. That's what it is. They don't want to think about it. But you know what? There's a lot of anxiety in the world about what if. And I think when you actually embrace it and talk about it, like if you're anxious about doing something, talking about it sometimes alleviates that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Going through it alleviates that anxiety where if you're constantly afraid of something, hiding from it is not the best avenue to get over it, right? right? And pretending it doesn't exist. It's like, I think it's an emu or an ostrich. That's like, if they get attacked, they put their head in the ground. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah ostrich. It's like, that's essentially what you're doing with all the things that you're afraid of. So what good is that? And, and honestly, you're kind of doing not only yourself, but your whole family a disservice from just hiding from all of your problems. It's like if you are late on your rent, ignoring the rent payment is not the way to like fix that problem. And I think it's become so predominant in our society to just like, oh, uh, like quiet quitting, right? We've heard about this where it's like, you just ghost your boss <laughs> and like, or like you go out on a date with someone and you're like, I don't want to talk to them. Let me just ghost to them. It's like, where are the people who are going to like face the problem? And be like, look, Gerard, we went out on a date and you're a nice guy, we but I don't, I don't think we're a good connection. Right. Right. Like, where's the respect of that? And also, I mean, like you said, speaking up about it, I think is super helpful because when you do, it, everybody's anxious. I mean, we live in an incredibly anxiety producing time and you, you know, you watch the news and everything is a bit crazy sometimes. Um, but I think that, uh. How do I phrase it? I think that if you are willing to talk about the things that make you the most uncomfortable, you realize that you're not alone in, in that, which then 
can not only motivate you, but can make you feel more secure. I think a lot of people are, are terrified that they're going to fail and they're going to be a big joke or something like that. And if you just kind of get out there and you start talking about it with other people, you'll find other I mean, me and you have these conversations pretty regularly where we talk about things that, you know, I at least, you know, you know talk about things that potentially we're afraid of, you know, like what's going to happen, you know, in the future or whatever it is. But then all of a sudden you start realizing that other people feel like that. Other people are going through it. Some of the most successful people you'll ever meet have felt like that at points. And then they and probably kind of still for, do. They should, you know, but most people think that their situation is unique to them and them only. Exactly. It's exactly. like, we're so self-centered well, yeah, like, like we're so narcissistic yeah that's exactly what that we think everything that happens only happens to us right. but it's exactly. like it's not and a lot of the time if you just talk about it with someone you'll realize that they're experiencing a lot of those same fears and maybe talking about it with someone will help you understand better ways to cope with it or deal with it so i agree i mean all of this is a conversation that could go on forever what before before we uh, we go though, I do want to talk to you a little bit more about real estate and kind of get your take on what's going on. Obviously, there's a lot of different things going on in the market right now. It's a very weird market. Um, I want to kind of hear what has your experience been so far, right? I think you have a kind of unique story in the sense that you know, for for people who don't know, Gerard came in to the industry is a solo agent. He joined our team. And uh, I think there's a unique kind of, you know, story there because it shows that you had a level of commitment by yourself, similar to what I did, right? I, I mean, I was on my own. Um, and then I ended up deciding to join a team as well. And it, it, I would just like to kind of hear your take on um, what your experience has been so far, any tips or advice that you have for someone, because I think we're seeing a lot of people who do want to get into the business. I don't know, just, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think that I did, I came in originally um, to Berkshire Hathaway um, as a solo agent. Um, I had, you know, when I was getting my license, I, I had kind of the, the plan already in place that I need to find the people that are doing it well. You know, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I um, came to Berkshire Hathaway and it's one of the reasons that, you know, I came to, you know, you and Blake. Um, was that coming from Letterman where I got to watch those bands at, constantly on a daily basis, look at what they're doing and how do they execute, how, how do the best in the business execute what they're doing? Um, and then how can I take that, you know, like, and learn from it? Um, I think that it, uh, it, that Letterman experience really helped me just in, in that sense, because I think that a lot of, I mean, I had, you know, I mean, everyone knows a real estate agent, you know, like everyone knows that, you know, like you can, you can go to any number of places and potentially not get the same experience. Um, but me coming from where I came from, I, I said, I, this is what I want to do. I want to learn from the bat. Like, I mean, you know. And for, for those of you who don't know, we, Gerard came to us initially to join the team and we told him we're not taking on any agents right rejected. now. We basically rejected him. That's was, the nice way of putting it. That's not basic. It's it's direct. And he still holds a grudge. Uh, <laughs> no. But in all seriousness, we we told Gerard that we weren't hiring at the time. It wasn't the right fit for us. But we told him, if you come into the office every day and you show that you're committed, we'll be here to support you. Come over to us, ask questions. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need help with, we're here to help you out. Um, and we'll see where we're at in six months, nine months. We'll reevaluate things. And Gerard came in every single day. Every single day, like clockwork. He came into the office. He showed up every single day, which number one for realtors is just showing up. A lot of people don't want to go to the office. A lot of people don't want to commit to a firm schedule. Um, but you did every single day, 845, like clockwork. He came into the office. He sat down and... It showed. I mean, we recognized it and we saw that. So well, I appreciate it. Yeah, but I mean, that's what it is, though. Yeah, I mean, you you have to be dedicated. If you're going to try something new, if you're going to do it halfway in, like I, you take a half measure from, you know, like. You can't be half pregnant. Wow. No. Yeah, there are, you aren't. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what it is. You know, like it, it, you really have to 
be willing to kind of show up. I, I mean, like you said, a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand how important it is to literally go into an office like we have and just literally listen as creepy as this might sound, but listen to how other agents speak on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, like, like listen to, you know, just the cadence. How they handle certain conversations. Right. You know, like, like you, because you're not only learning about the conversation, but then you're also learning how to deal with the client, you know, like and you just, just sitting there is important. You said the cadence, right? So it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Exactly. It, and that's, that's a huge that part. That is the, that's 90% of it. Right. You know, it's, it's all how you say it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, but people don't realize that, you know, I mean, a lot of new agents that kind of just, they're like, I'm going to get my license and then I'm just going to start selling houses. If you're not willing to put in all of that back work of literally just being a creep, literally just sitting. I mean, I, I would literally, I would come in. I didn't have any deals. I didn't have any clients or anything. Like that. I would literally just come and sit in the deal and, and uh, sit at the desk. And I would just like type on Google. And I was literally just sitting there listening. You know, I was literally just trying to literally pick up anything that I could get. And then also try to think about any questions that I could potentially have. And then just present those questions. Like it's, awesome. but it, it, I mean, you know, I mean, it, luckily it's worked out, but it, it takes a lot, you know I mean? Like most it people- takes time. Are, yeah, and if you're not willing to do that, you're just not gonna make it. Well, today with everybody's microwave mentality of expecting right, instant right. gratification, they don't realize, and I tell everybody who joins the team, I'm like, if you come into the business as a brand new agent, you should expect to not make any money for a year. Like yeah. to come in and set that as your expectation, yeah. yeah, right? The first year, the only thing you're here to do is learn. Right. And that's essentially what you did Obviously, you you had a very interesting way of doing it, um, but you also, because you came in every day, you you shortened that learning curve, mm -hmm. and that's why you were able to do a tremendous amount of business as a brand new agent once you joined the team in your first year, which you don't see. I mean, you're doing more deals right now than a lot of agents who've been in the business for five, ten plus years. Well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but it, it's, it's showing up every day. You know I mean? That, that's really what it is. So many people, you know, I was just thinking about it, that one of the worst things I think that could have ever happened to me, and this didn't happen, but like, let's say, you know, just on a, on a, a, a different world that like, let's say I, I, I got my license and then I had like a, like a, my grandfather or something was like, I have a $5 million house and I want you to sell it. And like I did, and say in the, the height of the COVID craziness, um, just I sold it, it in, in it two sold. weeks. And then I got my big check and I was like, well, I am a successful real estate agent. It almost would have been detrimental to my long-term experience or my long-term career um, because, you know, like, like, you know, just to kind of go back to what we were talking about before, like you have to struggle. You, Struggling is where you figure out where things work. You know, like if, if you're not, if things just become easy right away, at some point it's going to get really difficult and you're not going to be prepared for that. Right. Um, and we saw that, I mean, even last year in the market, right? Like the agents who all of a sudden their business doubled or tripled and from 2019 to 2020 and then 2021, right. all of those a lot of them had an inflated sense of self. They had an inflated oh, totally. sense right. of what they were totally. and who they were. Right. And it came back down to earth last year. Mm -hmm. And you saw the top agents who took that as an opportunity, who had laid the groundwork to grow, all of their business went up 10, 15, 20% in 2022. Whereas other people were seeing 50, 60, 70% reductions mm -hmm. in business. So you're absolutely right. A lot of people, they, they had one good year. Right? It's like the baseball player who has one good season yeah. and now they think that's who they are. And in reality, greatness isn't achieved off of one good year, right? Yeah. It's consistent excellence year after year after year after year over the course of an entire career. And then even think about that. Like, remember Brady Anderson? Yeah. He had 50 home runs that one year and there might've been some extra reasons as to why that happened. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like a joke now because he had one good year and then the next year, everything just went down and continuously went down. You don't want to have a career like that. You don't want right. to have a career where you're like, all right, well, I'm a shining star right out of the, the gate. Um, and then my star is gradually getting dimmer. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Any tips or advice 
I mean, what's your take on, on things right now? Obviously, market's very active. Where do you think this goes over the next couple of years? We've got banks on the verge of collapse. Yeah. Interest rates are up, then down, then up again. Where does this all end, Gerard Smith? <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about like a, a, a potential collapse and things like that. Analytically, I don't see that happening. You know, I, I mean, I, I hear a lot of times. What do you define as a collapse? Like a wait. Give me a percentage. Because I think that's another thing. People are like five percent collapse. Well, that's not a collapse. No, <laughs> that's a no, correction. That, that, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like that's 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 par for the course. That's going to happen. You know, right. like eventually that's going to happen. But then eventually it's also going to go up 10, 15 percent over time. You know, it's it's micro and macro. Um, I one of the the things that I have to deal with on a regular basis right now is with buyers. Where I mean, I, I set an open house last weekend where we had. 15 different couples come within a two hour period. Literally, I was like running out of like information that I had printed. Um, but I have other buyers that are like, well, the, the market's like slowing down. And it's like, well, maybe, but like, I, I'm We're not, not seeing, seeing it. it. Right. <laughs> you know, like, in I'm fact, seeing like highest and best. And I'm seeing, you know, like bidding wars pretty consistently. I, I put a house on the market two weeks ago. We had 14 showings in like within the first 24 hours of me posting it or, you know, listing home. You had them scheduled. Um, it was to the point where like the, 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 the seller was like, what am I supposed to do? He, like, I can't like be in my house this weekend. It was almost back to like activity wise, back to where we saw it a year ago. Right. Which is crazy when you think interest rates are double, right? Yeah. And prices yeah. were up 5%. Yeah. And, but you're absolutely right. It's like, but I think that a part of our job has to be educating our um, clients as well as possible on that, because a lot of times people listen to the news and they hear like these like scary doomsday things that are non-experts opinions on the situation. And you also always, when someone is telling you something, you have to know where is their incentive lie? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like I have a friend of mine who's a financial advisor. And so he's been talking a lot about the markets and, you know, everything that's going on. And he says, he's like, the news never has you wake up in the morning and tells you everything's okay. Go back to bed. Yeah. Right. Have you ever seen that ever? No. Their job is to sell advertising and to do so, they need your attention and to get your attention. Things either have to be really good or really bad. And right now they sell the idea that things are really bad. And with real estate, it's the same thing. Not only that, but what they're talking about could be applicable in certain areas, but you have to take, as you said, a microeconomic view on what's happening locally, right? I don't necessarily care about what's happening in San Diego, California, or Austin, Texas, right? Yes, in a macro level, signs of things happening in other markets could make a difference and matter, but if your job is to put your family in a house today for the next 15 years, you need to be educated locally on what's going on and understand what those options are. And our job and our team and our philosophy of not focusing on the sale, but focusing on being a real estate advisor, right? Is we, our incentive is not to sell you the house, but to build the relationship and nourish and, and care for that relationship as people say as i say all the time for the next 20 or 30 years <laughs> right it's true it's true and that's that's one of the benefits that we kind of provide i think is being so analytical with not only facts but figures you know i mean we can literally pull up you know statistical information be like i know that this is what you're hearing but this is what math is saying you know like this, and and if you want to argue with math like that's good luck. Like that's fine, but like right. you're probably going to lose at some point. And we saw that with the buyers who waited from last year. Exactly. Right. They exactly. now pay twice the interest rate. Exactly. They pay five percent exactly. more, and that house cost them twenty percent more. Well, that's the a that's, month. That's the thing. The interest rates went up, have. but also the price of the va the, the, the value of the house went up. Correct. So now you've just screwed yourself. And, and the thing that I always and this is every investment guru out there tries to predict what's going to happen right? 
the best thing you can do is not try to predict what's going to happen, but observe what is going on in the last 90 to 120 days. And I get, I get a kick out of the people who say the market's going to crash and they call for the market crash for five years, six <laughs> years, seven years. And then the market crashes and they're like, got it. I timed it. I called 2007. Meanwhile, they were calling for a crash since 2000 and they missed 75% of the growth for a 25% correction. And it's like in 2017, 2018, you weren't even in the business yet. People were saying, these prices are getting out of hand. They're getting crazy. This is too expensive. And it's like, if you believe that and you waited, right, you missed 50 to 60% appreciation. And even if the market corrected 25% today, it would still be 20 to 30% more expensive than it was five years ago, six years ago. So all you did was cost yourself time, money, and quite frankly, quality of life because you waited on the sidelines and didn't own your home and provide that kind of foundation for your life and your family because you listened to some guy who was trying to sell you advertising well, that's what on he, Fox News or CNN. Yeah. And I mean, even if you think about the people that did, you know, like unfortunately lose their homes in the crash of, you know, 07, 08, look at what the value of those houses are today. today. You know, I mean, it's, that's a, that's a very different argument. If you were able to, you know, maintain your mortgage at that point, you are doing wonderfully today. You know, like that's why it's. Well, then that's, that's why, and I tell everybody, it's like, you have to be comfortable. Like even now people are trying to sell people on like, Hey, uh, you know, buy a house, you're going to refi. And it's like, okay, that might be true. But every buyer, and you can ask every single person that I work with, I don't tell them, oh yeah, you can refi, that's what you should be focused on. I tell them, you need to be comfortable with this payment today, exactly. yeah. this price exactly. today, exactly. the economics of today. If you can refi 12 months from now, 18 months from now, 24 months from now, and that's a plus, great. But you can't bank on that. You can't bank on 2007. Real estate always goes up in value. So that's why I'm buying. I don't care if I own five houses and I got 110% loan on every single one of them. It's like fundamentally things are out of your control, right? The contingency planning. So you have to have that balance of, of the happy medium, right? Of like being aggressive, but being conservative and being educated. And I think that's, that's what our job is, is to try and I always say my job is to give you the information to let you make an informed and comfortable decision, right? I give you the information, you're knowledgeable, you can make an educated decision and feel comfortable making a decision for yourself once I've provided you with the accurate information. That's all we're trying to do here is help people get the info to make an educated decision. What they decide to do is totally up to them. Yeah. And that is our job. Any finishing thoughts? Go no. listen to Gerard Smith on Spotify. I like We're you. We're bringing him out of retirement. No, 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 no. Uh, no, thank you for having me. I thank had, you. I had a wonderful time. 